Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the 2024 NOF competition. My name is Nicole Cody, and I am one of the four NOF coordinators for today's event. Uh, at this time, I'd welcome everyone to turn on their cameras as part of the competition today. I, along with my co-coordinator, Sam Gold, want to welcome you to this incredible tradition at Toledo Law. Before I turn it over to Dean Barrows to get us started, I wanted to take a moment to provide some helpful information on how today's competition will be conducted. First, I want to encourage anyone watching today to set your screen to grid view to maximize your viewing experience. You can find this option on the top right corner of your screen, and it should be the option to the right. This will allow you to see everyone at the same time, including all judges and competitors. Today will consist of oral arguments by the appellants, Ms. Kara Marshall and Mr. Aaron Hill, followed by the appellees, Mr. Marshall Kewick and Mr. Tanner Easley. After arguments and rebuttal, the judges will then leave to deliberate and come to a decision. Despite the fact that you cannot see an audience today, we do have a large number of people in attendance in our virtual audience. And there will be no chat or Q&A functions available for this event. Additional factual background information on this case, as well as the biographies for our competitors and our distinguished judges can be found on the link that you used to originally register for this event. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Dean Gross for his opening remarks. Thank you, Nicole. I want to welcome all of you to this year's pandemic version of the Fornoff Finals. This is uh, really remarkable, I have to say, seeing all the competitors and all the judges virtually like this. My thanks to all of you for uh, making this work. This is a challenge uh, for everybody, um, but I'm really optimistic that it'll go uh, very well. My thanks to Nicole Cody and Sam Gold uh, for their work as foreign off coordinators and to Professor Eric Chafee as the faculty coordinator. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into administering any of these this type of competition. So my thanks to all of you. My thanks to Heather Carnes, especially for her help with the technology. Uh, we're very appreciative of that. Um, my thanks to all of the judges for participating. Thank you for doing this and uh, hopefully this will all go smoothly. And last but not least, I really want to thank Judge Carr for his uh, help this year and help for many, many years in getting our judges for this competition. Judge Carr, we thank you uh, for all of your work and all of your support over the years. Now I'd like to turn it over to Sam Gold to get things started. Good morning, everyone. The judges of the Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit of the United States is now in session. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable Sixth Circuit of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. For the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. The Honorable Judge Barker, Judge Knapp, and Judge Pearson presiding. Good afternoon, everyone. Appellants, are you ready? Yes, Your Honor. Is the court ready to proceed? Appley, are you ready as well? Yes, Your Honor. Appellants, if you please proceed and kindly introduce yourselves before you begin your argument. And remember, if you'd like to reserve time for rebuttal, I'd appreciate knowing up front. Is the court ready to proceed, Your Honor? It is indeed. May it please the court. My name is Kara Barshall, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Aaron Hill, represent appellants Adam and Sarah Hussein in this matter. I will be addressing the issue regarding whether Section 3604B of the Fair Housing Act applies to post acquisition discrimination. At this time, I would like to reserve one minute of rebuttal for my co counsel, Mr. Aaron Hill. So reserved. Thank you. We are here today because our clients appealed the district court's decision, which ruled in favor of opposing parties' motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. Today, I'm asking the court to hold that the language of Section 3604B of the Fair Housing Act applies to post discrimination acquisition for three reasons. First, a reading of the statute in its plain language reveals that Section 3604B reaches post acquisition discrimination. 
Second, Congress intended that the language reach post acquisition discrimination. And finally, holding that the statute reaches post acquisition discrimination would ensure a safeguard for those who fall within a protected class. At this time, would the court like a brief recitation of the facts? Briefly. Adam and Sarah Hussein, along with their children, age two and four, moved into Sheridan Apartments in February of 2019, which is managed by Quality Par Properties Incorporated, which is the appellee. The Hussein family are United States citizens who practice the Islamic faith. Soon after moving into their apartment, the ruthless discrimination began. The harassment by the tenants ranged from verbal threats to threats of actual physical violence on the entire family, including the young children. The Husseins pleaded for help and appellees did and continue to do nothing to help the Husseins throughout this entire traumatic experience. Section 34, 3604B of the Fair Housing Act states that it shall be unlawful to discriminate against any person in the terms, conditions, or privileges of sale or rental or in the privileges or services or facilities in connection therewith because of religion. It's important to break down this statute into phrases and individual words and analyze the meaning of each when holding that the statute as a whole reaches post acquisition conduct. And when you say post acquisition conduct, Councillor Barshall, you're talking about actually living there. You've already rented it or leased it. Now you're living in the space, correct? Correct, Your Honor. If there's a different meaning to be had, why are both terms there? sell or rental because in this honor it can apply to either instance so it can apply to the sale itself the discrimination or it can apply to a rental it can apply to either or please go ahead okay. the word rental according to section 3602 of the fair housing act includes to lease to sublease for consideration the right to occupy a premise and in the case at hand, the rental is for an apartment unit inhabited by the family. The tenancies go on for weekly, monthly, and most commonly yearly. The duration goes on into the future and does not stop once the tenants inhabit the unit. Well, counselor, counselor, I, I'm just I'm, I'm struggling just a little bit. Isn't a, a lease or a rental transaction a transfer of an interest in real estate for a for a fixed period of time? I mean, isn't isn't it analogous to a sale in that regard that I'm actually uh, the, the landlord is conveying something to the tenant? Yes, Your Honor, it could be interpreted that way. Um, the big difference here is that with a sale, you are actually transferring ownership from one person to another, title from one person to another. And in this case, Quality Property still owns the premise which is inhabited by the Hussein, Hussein family. The Husseins are just used for a fixed period of time. But but the landlord transferred the right of possession, frankly, to that tenant, did they not? Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. They did transfer the possession. However, it was not a sale. The Husseins, if they want to leave, they have to leave. They can't sell off the the apartment that they live in. That's the big difference here between a sale and a rental. The term has an ongoing connotation where in contrast, the term sale, like we were saying earlier, was the transfer of ownership and title from, from one person to another. Next, we move on to the terms, privileges, and conditions. Defined in its plain language, a condition is a circumstance in which people live, work, and do things. And a privilege is a special right or advantage that a particular group of people have. And many courts have held that these terms, privileges, and conditions have ongoing connotations meaning that the privileges acquired by tenants do not just end, the tenants have acquired their residence. And we see this in one case specifically, the, the Committee Concerning Community Improvement versus City of Modesto Ninth Circuit case. They stated that the inclusion of the word privileges in the statute implicates continuing rights. And the Block versus Frischhold case in the Seventh Circuit also indicated that these terms, privileges and conditions refer to not just the sale itself, but to certain benefits or protections flowing from and following the sale or rental. So relative to the circumstances here, what are the privileges you believe your clients were to have enjoyed that were interfered with or just didn't turn out as what you would have hoped because of discriminatory reasons? 
Yes, Your Honor. So some of the privileges in this case is include um, they had access to the laundry rooms. They had access to common areas where the mailboxes were located. Uh, that is a common area all the tenants used and had a privilege to use. And that's where most of the discrimination occurred. Um, there was an actual sign that was posted on the front of the Hussein's mailbox that said, go home Muslim terrorists. And in the common area in the laundry room, Hussein's put a flyer up because they're devout Muslims and it, the flyer entailed a clothing drive at their mosque. And someone took black marker and scribbled on that paper and said, don't donate to Muslims. So their rights were infringed upon because they have access to and privileges to these common areas and the tenants were being discriminatory and not letting them use the areas as they so please, please freely. What about the landlord? Did the landlord have some involvement, take some action that infringed on this privilege of sale or rental? Your Honor, the landlords actually didn't infringe on any of these rights. However, when the Husseins let the ten, when the sorry sorry the Husseins let the landlord know about what was going on, they simply failed to act. It was an act of omission on their part. Even the property manager Natalie Rose responded to the Hussein saying, "In light of 9/11, it's not unreasonable that these other tenants are uncomfortable with quote people like you." And so although they weren't being outwardly discriminatory, they were hinting at the fact, well, hey, you are a Muslim family. It's reasonable that these people are being discriminatory against you. Counselor, are you seriously conceding that Manager Rose's comment wasn't discriminatory? No, that Natalie Rose's comment was very discriminatory. They, she just, I was just saying she was not actually putting the signs on the mailbox or defacing the laundry room signs. She was simply saying that we don't have a responsibility and it's reasonable that these other tenants are acting this way. Well, there's certainly been case law that goes to the point of an irresponsible um, response to discrimination can be actionable, isn't it? If the landlord does too little or nothing at all, that could be considered actionable, discriminatory. Am I wrong? No, Your Honor, you're not wrong. There is case law that says that landlords can be held liable. In this case, we just see that it is the tenants who are being discriminatory. In the other cases, it's the actual landlord who is being discriminatory, where the court holds that the landlord is liable in that instance. But, but Counselor, don't we need a bright line test here, something along the line of a constructive eviction? Because otherwise, it feels like we're heading down a a, a, a slippery slope that you know someone might not feel safe because their neighbor is flying a Confederate flag or or has Nazi memorabilia on their car. I mean, I just to, to me the, the the danger here is not having a bright line demarcation. Even if I were to find that uh, or we were to find that that you have uh, this post acquisition cause of action. Absolutely. If I may finish, your honor, you may yeah. briefly answer and then conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, Your Honor, there should be a bright line rule in this instant, especially when it comes to the civil rights of others. And Title VII, which my co-counsel will talk about briefly, is a test that we are hoping that the court will adopt to hold these landlords responsible. And therefore, we ask that this court interpret Section 3604 Act broadly, because as stated by the Francis case, there is no circuit split as to whether Section 34 3604 reaches post acquisition conduct. It does. I now pass it over to my co counsel, Mr. Aaron Hill. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Good afternoon. Is the court ready to proceed? Please. Thank you. Again, my name is Aaron Hill. I am also a counsel for the Usains in this case. I'll be addressing issue two, which is whether can a landlord can be held liable for tenant on tenant harassment. First, I'll be speaking on why Title VII is applicable to the Fair Housing Act, and many circuits have found that to be true. Second, I'll be speaking on a hostile housing environment claim and how the Husseins have presented enough facts to present a hostile housing environment claim. And third, going on to reasons why the trial court erred in this case. Starting off with Title VII, Title VII is a civil rights act created around the civil rights era to fight discrimination and hate in the employment context. 
Now, the relevance of that statute is found by many circuits because they found it necessary and usable that Title VII doctrine is applicable to the Fair Housing Act for two key reasons. One, the intents of the act are the same. They were both meant to fight intent in the respective fields, employment and in housing, and they were created around the same time around the Civil Rights Act. So they are sister acts in that regard. The second reason being that their language is also similar. They both have a same statutory structure, and furthermore, they have a terms, conditions, or privileges language exactly in them. And in that regard, the Second Circuit of Francis v. King Park and the Seventh Circuit of Wetzel v. Glenn have held that they are applicable to these cases. And it's especially that what the Husseins are asking for today is the transfer of the hostile work environment into the Fair Housing Act as a hostile housing environment. Now, establishing the... Excuse me, uh, Your Honor, I think you're muted. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Hill. At most, the statutory language seems ambiguous on the post acquisition issue, but the legislative history seems to support limiting the FHA to discrimination that affects access. Why shouldn't we interpret the statute in a way that is consistent with the legislative history? Thank you, Your Honor. So, speaking on the legislative history, there's very little facts on the legislative history of the Fair Housing Act. We do have certain quotes and phrases from the senators sponsoring the bill at the time. For example, Senator Mondes saw the Fair Housing Act was the way to create a truly balanced and integrated living pattern. Now, those terms itself are quite ambiguous, but again, an integrated and balanced, that requires at least something further than just stopping at the door. And understanding that intent, both the Department of Housing and expressing its continual contact with Congress has found that the intent of the Fair Housing Act includes both a post-acquisition claim and that a landlord can be held liable for tenant on tenant harassment. And in that Mr. regard, Hill, Mr. Hill, if Congress had really intended for the FHA to reach all forms of discrimination in housing from access to habitability, why didn't it say so specifically the way that it did with Title VII in the employment setting? Um, sorry if I cut you off earlier, Your Honor, but in response to that, um, rent, and as my co counsel stated, rental actually includes that right for such tenant on liable um, harassment. For example, when we think about the plain language of the word rental, people in most common terms say, hi, I'm renting this apartment. That renting is synonymous with living, and as such, those terms, conditions, or privileges are continuous in that regard. And if the privilege is the landlord and the landlord infringes on those such things, then Congress's intent in just their plain reading of the statute intended to have landlords be liable. And understanding that part, Wetzel v. Glenn created four elements for the hostile housing environment claim. One, a basis for liability. Two, um, severe pervasive harassment. Three, a harm. And four, a uh, protected class. Under Sir, may I ask? Thank you, Councilor Hill. You heard your colleague and my colleague talk about a bright line test. And I understood Ms. Barshall is agreeing there should be a bright line. Can you tell me where you would suggest this court draws the line on when a landlord becomes liable. You've mentioned tenant on tenant. We know the case law regarding that, but I think in this case, you're asking landlord on tenant. When or where should that line be drawn? Yes, Your Honor. I think that's a very valid question. And understanding that, I think the line is in the element of severe or pervasive harassment. I think if it rises to a level to be considered severe by a fact finder or pervasive enough by a fact finder, then we attend into the integration of the Fair Housing Act. And that's what- May I interrupt to ask, severe and pervasive by any actor or must the landlord be an actor or complicit in the act? Just help me to understand. Yes, Your Honor. So if the landlord themselves are severe or pervasive, or allow such a behavior or per se a culture of pervasiveness or complicit in that pervasive behavior and environment, then they can be held liable. So speaking on the element of pervasive or severe, the uh, Husseins have presented all the facts necessary to hit that element. The Husseins presented on the record that on each and every week while they were on the la landlord's property, they were harassed. In some point- hey, counselor, counselor, is severe and per pervasive an objective or a subjective standard? For example, if if I have a, a protected class who's particularly susceptible, um, an eggshell plaintiff, if you were, does that, does that uh, give rise to a claim? Or uh, how do we define this? 
So currently the circuit definitely doesn't ha doesn't have a definition of pervasiveness in that kind of realm. But looking at the second and seventh, seventh, they say it would be an objective standard of looking at this. That understandably that if there's a pattern of persuade between of the environment that they are per se in, then they a landlord could be held liable. So the Husseins have presented that case or under those facts because again there was a pattern every single week objectively on the Husseins of harassment and either not then they also hit the severe prong here which is in that case they were their children and their wife was assaulted here today and in that regard a severeness in that regard is physical harm and danger to them on the premises which rises at least a level to enough to hit to allow the Husseins to present a claim. Okay, why so, isn't there a, why, why isn't there a lawsuit here against the fellow tenants um, as opposed to against the landlord? I, I, I'm, I'm missing something. I don't even see the tenants' names in the complaint. I, I don't know who they are. You allege that they are tenants, but why, why isn't this cause of action against them uh, or or even a, a criminal prosecution? What what am I missing here? As the court notes, the record does not indicate. Where, where the who, who the trespassers or the harassers were necessarily by name or by identifier. But what's really important here, even if they were just trespassers, we do not know. The landlord still has control of that such area and are liable for allowing such trespassers to discriminate and harass their tenants. And did the landlord in this case, as the record revealed, the landlord did anything such as put up cameras or anti discrimination signs, anything at all? No, Your Honor, and that's the point that Husseins are trying to make. They did absolutely nothing. If anything, the most minimum they could do was create a standard in their tenant handbook to say no harassment based on religion or nor uh, make it a rule for tenants not to harass each other. That is the bare minimum the landlord could have done and would have been reasonable. But instead, they did nothing. And that is why the Husseins were brought here today under the Fair Housing Act. And that is, again, why the basis liability element is met. They have. The landlords have fused to do anything, and they had the arsenal to do so, as noted by the Seventh Circuit. Landlords have plenty of tools to change such behaviors in their environment. For example, they can change a tenant handbook. They can add signs, as the court noted. They can add security in certain places. These are things that a tenant or landlord can do, excuse me, change the behavior on the property for a hostile housing environment. And necessarily is why the basis for liability. Okay, counselor, can you direct me to a single case uh, a, a single court of appeals in, in the country um, that has done what you're asking us to do here, which is a pure tenant on tenant situation, no involvement by the management, the management's kids or employees, but, but a pure tenant on tenant case. Uh, what, what are, tell me what case you're asking us to follow that isn't distinguishable. Yes, your honor. So. The case we're looking at is Francis V. King Park. In that case, an African-American man was living in a duplex kind of style apartment building, and his tenant was harassing him based on his race, throwing trash at him and speaking racial slurs to him. And that African-American man went to the police pleading for help. And then the police went to the landlord, please asking them for help. And in both cases, when those tenant and the police asked, the landlord did nothing. And that is regard why the Second Circuit found it necessary to hold a landlord liable in this regard, because they both have the arsenal and tools to change the behavior, even more so than the police. And in that regard, that's the, the decision we're asking this court to follow. And the trial court was wrong in that regard, because all the rights to, to saints present their case is enough probable facts. And on the record, they have done so. They have established that the landlord in this case has established a hallway of hate culture on their premises, and they did nothing and enabled it. In that regard, the Hussein's deserve relief. Every citizen in the United States under the Fair Housing Act deserves to be free of hate in the housing context. And we're asking this court to extend, just like the Second Circuit, to landlord to be liable for tenant on tenant harassment, and to read the plain language of the statute today of 3604B to include plain language of rental, and that includes post acquisition. Thank you for your time. Councillor Hill, um, is your time expired? Yes. All right, I, I will reserve this question possibly for your rebuttal. Thank you. For the appellee.
May I proceed, Your Honors? Welcome. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself for the record. Yes. My name is Marshall Kewitt, and along with my co-counsel, Mr. Tanner Easley, represent the appellees in today's case, Quality Properties, Inc. Now, today we will ask that you affirm the decision of the district court and dismiss the appellant's claim for failure to state a claim upon which relief may be granted. Now, Why should we do that, sir, when the record pretty obviously shows at least something that could be considered discriminatory animus committed by your client? And I'm speaking about at least two things. One is a statement made by Manager Rose. The other is the failure to enforce part of your very own lease agreement. And I'm speaking about item M as in Mary of the rules and regulations. And you know it already, but I'll read it to you. Tenants will not unduly interfere with use of common areas, recreational or ancillary facilities by other tenants or other persons. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, in regards to both of those facts, first, the uh, the comments made by our uh, building manager. Uh, now, we do not believe these statements to be discriminatory in their fashion. In fact, uh, what we believe that our, our, our manager was just pointing out the mere unfortunate fact that the nature of our country after the events of 9-11 have created a society of individuals who treat individuals of the Islamic faith differently uh than other members of the of the of society uh, so it's, and that's uh, all she was pointing it out. is what it is problem is that it it What's that, is what it is is that the response uh simply she was just stating the, the unfortunate fact that members of society feel this way she in no way shape or form said that she felt that way or that quality properties felt that way but merely it was an unfortunate fact that society felt that way uh in regards to the second provision uh in within the lease itself Section M, there's also a provision in the lease in which gives the landlord section 13 uh, the 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 ability to upon their uh, willingness to e evict tenants or take action against tenants. It is it is up to the decision of the landlord. And in fact, the landlord is not forced to by the lease to evict tenants for breach, but it is up to the discretion of the landlord to evict the tenants for this breach. And in the context of the case we have here today, we simply have tenants who are unidentified. We, we have no knowledge of where they live. And out of all the actions presented by the appellants, uh, only two of these actions are actually identified to be actions of tenants, one in which beer cans were uh, placed in their lawn, and then the other, the discriminatory statements. But again, we have no identification of who these individuals are. Now, opposing counsel- Well, also, isn't that because of lack of action, no video cameras? placed um, no canvassing the rental property to ask what others might know who might even admit the egregious behavior. Any such actions taken? Uh, no, Quality Properties has not taken such actions into investigating into the lives of its tenants uh, through this through this manner. Uh, largely, uh, in, in, in a type of investigation into the lives of its tenants uh, would cause some room for concern in which a, a, ten, a landlord could be found to you know interfere within the quality enjoyment of its tenants through this matter. Uh, furthermore, there is nothing within the Fair Housing Act itself which uh, which forces a landlord to implement such cameras or devices into the building itself. Uh, the, the section under question today, 604B, which pushes into the, which appellants argue pushes into the post acquisition realm, uh, doesn't in fact in this case. And we have large legislative history and the plain language reading of the statute and circuit case precedent to support why 3604B only applies to fair lease terms towards its appellants. Now- Isn't that an absurd reading of that statute though, that you can rent or lease this property, but how you live in it is not subject to law. That's really what you're saying, that once you sign the lease or the rental agreement, you're free game to anyone who doesn't like who you are or what you represent. Uh, actually, Your Honor, if I may clarify, 3604B, as it does uh, protect that initial access, it also leaves room open for a constructive eviction claim. As Judge Nett pointed out, if a uh, tenant undertakes such constructive eviction elements, then they could bring this action uh, towards a landlord in this, in this in this premises. But the appellants here have failed to bring. So, so counsel, counsel, here. are you are you conceding that if uh... That, that there would be valid a valid claim for 
tenant on tenant against landlord for co tenant uh, actions if it rose to the level of a constructive discharge? Are you conceding that? Uh, no, what I am conceding though is that if a landlord was responsible for the actions in which they actually discriminated against its tenants, which ended up being, which ended up turning into an actual or constructive eviction towards those tenants. Well, well, that, 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 tenants that's not that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the, the fellow tenants behave so badly uh, and with the knowledge of the landlord that it rises to the level of a constructive eviction. Um, would in in that circumstance would uh, a cause of action under the FHA lie against the landlord? Uh, no, the the Fair Housing Act only covers that an actual that that actual discrimination from the landlord towards its tenants. Now, uh, opposing counsel brought up the case Francis versus Ford, in which a landlord could be found through tenant on tenant uh, action to be discriminating. However, there's large differences in that case at hand compared to ours here. Uh, in that case at hand, a landlord was found discriminatory based on tenant on tenant discrimination, but that was only because well, one, we had an identified tenant who the landlord knew of uh, multiple times of the conduct that that tenant was conducting upon the other tenant. And further, uh, we, we, we had other acts by that landlord to show that they actually got involved in other tenant on tenant disputes, yet, Besides the warning they, they received here, they they failed to interfere on this tenant on tenant dispute, and, and that was shown to be because of a racial animus. Now here we have no showing that quality properties interfered with other tenants uh, previously. It, just as such as we did not enter, as quality properties did not interfere here. Uh, that so that showing cannot be shown here today. That no discriminatory actions by quality properties uh, have affected the tenants in this fashion to reach a constructive eviction type claim. Now. We can see throughout 3604 that this, this provision only lies towards that initial access to that pre-acquisition realm and not post-acquisition uh, through, the, through the actual rest of 3604. We have 3604A, B, C, and D. And 3604A uh, protects uh, a tenant's rights to that building after an offer is made that it can't be refused. So if uh, a refusal to sell or rent that premises after that initial offer is made uh, because of their racial classification or protection in a classified cl uh, in a members of a uh, of a class, then that cannot uh, be. And that would, that's what 3604A would protect. Uh, further, 3604B protects the terms of the lease as are is stated that the actual terms of the lease cannot be discriminatory towards. Mr. Kewitt, sorry. Uh I'd like to interrupt just because you're making important points and I don't want to misunderstand you. So answer this for me. What power does a landlord actually have in a situation where a tenant is dealing or alleging dealing with or alleging harassment? It sounds as if in response to my colleague's question, you say nothing, not even if the harassment reaches the level of constructive eviction. Is that your answer? Landlord has no power, nothing to be done. Uh, well, thank you for that question because I want to be clear on this too. Yes, a landlord does have the power of eviction, but again, this eviction must result in in, in a very uh, solid, concrete reason for eviction. Uh, in this case at hand, we don't have any identity of the tenants. We have no identity of where even where they, these tenants live. Uh, an investigation into these matters would provide. Well, a, isn't a that the willful blindness? Because can it be interpreted that manager Rose, she seems to know where they live. I mean, they're not identified in the record, but the one thing she didn't say is those people aren't your neighbors. What she said is, I get it. You should get it. Live through it. Uh, if if I may, I believe, I don't know if the record, uh, to my knowledge, the record does not uh, uh, subsist of the knowledge that the manager had in which these tenants lived uh, as far as quality properties knows. Well, that's my tenants. point. Sometimes the absence of evidence is not an absence of evidence. What she didn't say is, I don't know who's doing this to you. What she said is, I know why they're doing it to you and you just need to suck it up buttercup until it's over. That's the point I made. Uh, if I may, your honor, the, uh, the, the, the discrimination caused by the caused by these other tenants uh, towards the appellants at hand is is a terrible matter, and 
quality properties is sympathetic to these matters, but simply the, the statements by Senator Rose were pointing out that mere unfortunate fact of how people behave. Now within this, if I may briefly answer and conclude, Your Honor. But let me ask you this, if we take your statement to its logical conclusion, we'd have no civil rights laws. Because what I interpret you to be saying is people are how they are. And you just have to live with that. Why don't you resolve that and then you can um, let your colleague take over? Sure, Your Honor. Uh, well, simply, we have uh, a society in common law to back this society that a landlord cannot interfere unduly into the lives of its tenants in this matter. Now, it, it's not the place of a landlord to police its settings and to protect uh, every aspect of the lives of its tenants. It is a very unfortunate fact that these tenants, that the appellants here today were facing these actions and facing these statements. But simply, there is no federal law. There is nothing in the Fair Housing Act under 3604-17 in which places a landlord to police these actions and to investigate into the lives of its tenants in this matter. Uh, and that's just the, the unfortunate fact we face under these statutes. Now, at this time, I'd like to hand it over to my co-counsel, Mr. Tanner Easley, who will finish out the appellee's case in chief. Thank you. Mr. Easley, the HUD regulation is federal law. Why shouldn't it be applicable to the facts in the case such as the one before us? If I may, Your Honor, uh, the HUD regulations need no deference in this case uh, because Title VII itself is not worth being analogized. Uh, so, in this case, uh, the, employer, uh, the employer liability model should not be imported because uh, of the distinctive agency principles at play in an employer-employee relationship uh, that does not exist in a landlord-tenant relationship. For employers, uh, when they hire an employee, uh, it establishes this agency principle uh, of which liability is based on. The same principle is not applied for landlords and their tenants. Uh, and this can be seen in tort law, uh, where employers are liable for their employees under the doctrine of respondent superior. The same doctrine is not applied to landlords and tenants because tenants largely live independent lives separate from their landlords. Uh, and it's because of this that landlords have less uh, control over their tenants uh, as compared to an employer has over their employee. Well, well that's well, an well, interesting sir, concept. Uh, uh, go ahead, Judge Pearson. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Judge Knapp. Employer-employee relationship ends, meaning you, you, you don't lose your job, but you go home. You go home to a place where you spend your off work hours, weekends, holidays. So it would seem that if Congress thought it important enough to protect you temporarily during this employee-employee or relationship like Title VII clearly does, then your colleague on the other side is likely correct. The privilege of sale or rental means while you're living there. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, Your Honor, you're asking uh, if it does apply post-acquisition, uh, then why should it not uh, apply to landlords? Right. Why you said that you didn't think Title VII was worthy of being analogized to the FHA situation we have. And, and I'm just pushing back on that a bit. If you can respond before going on to Judge Knapp. Uh, yes, if I may, Your Honor. Uh, the answer is that the agency principle is that which liability is based on. Uh, so because the landlord and uh, tenant have different rights, uh, for example, tenants have rights of quiet enjoyment that a landlord cannot interfere in. Uh, it is only when it is absolutely necessary that a landlord interfere with these rights. And that's why due to these distinct principles, uh, an employer liability model should not be imported. When does it become necessary? Um, whether it's direct action by the landlord or as a result of imputation, is, is there no um, harassment that would make it necessary for a landlord to become more directly involved or liable, I should say? The standard that has been adopted in the Seventh Circuit, Your Honor, is that uh, under the Halperin Court, uh, the court held that uh, in the cases where uh, landlords were specifically discriminatory in their actions, uh, met the standard of constructive eviction. 
then it is uh, applicable under this statute. Uh, however, the plaintiffs do not bring a claim of constructive eviction in this case uh, because it, it uh, does not meet that standard. Thank you, sir, and I appreciate the indulgence, Judge Knapp. Thank you, Judge Pearson. Uh, Council, why, why does the landlord have rules? Well, a landlord has rules because uh, they do have uh, some control over their tenants. However, this is largely different than the uh, employer-employee relationship uh, that the opposing council analogizes. Okay, well, I, I get some of that, but uh, why do they have a rule about not playing music too loud or not or, or behaving yourself in the in the kind? Why, why do they have those rules? Who, who or I should ask another way: Who are those rules intended to protect? Those rules mainly exist within the common law, Your Honor. Uh, of no, 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 no. I'm talking about rules that are incorporated into the lease. Uh, you know, the tenants are to protect the quiet enjoyment of other residents and will not play radios, stereos, or other such devices in such a manner as to disturb others. And then it says tenants will not unduly interfere with the use of common areas, recreational or ancillary facilities by other tenants or other persons authorized to use such facilities. Why do they have those rules? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Many of those rules are based on common law doctrines. However, uh, the rules themselves are simply uh, contractual in nature. They do not flow from the statute that the uh, opposing counsel brings this claim under. This is not something that is required uh, to meet the uh, the federal statutory standard uh, because it is contractual in nature, and that's why those rules exist, Your Honor. But don't those don't don't those rules demonstrate the the ongoing nature that the, the transaction isn't really done and that the landlord does reserve to itself the ability to control the behavior of one tenant vis-a-vis -vis another and doesn't that implicate them in the uh, in the fair housing uh, act to be clear your honor those rules uh, are set out specifically within the lease at the initial time of rental uh, because uh, landlords only really have a a duty to upkeep and maintain property uh, for the enjoyment of its residents. However, that ne does not necessarily mean that a landlord is liable uh, for the actions of all of their tenants. Uh, as the Halpern Court stated, this is something that's merely a, a quarrel between neighbors. Uh, just because neighbors have disagreements and there is harassment going on does not necessarily mean it meets the standard of the federal statute to hold them li to hold a landlord liable. Uh, furthermore, uh, and if we did find, Counselor, that it is pervasive and severe and objectively offensive, then what? Would you still say the landlord has no obligation or no liability? Uh, well, under under the uh, hostile housing environment claim uh, of where you pull that uh, per, uh, pervasive element from, uh, the most, the first and most important element is the fact that there must be a basis to impute liability. Within this circuit, uh, the Shellhammer v. Llewellyn case uh, is really the only limited precedence for uh, hostile housing environment claims. And in that case, uh, a landlord was uh, discriminating uh, against a tenant uh, in, in two instances of sexual harassment. Uh, now, the court uh, only impliedly recognized a hostile housing environment claim because uh, the plaintiff did not meet the factual standard uh, to even bring it. Uh, so they disregarded it because the two instances of sexual harassment was not enough to establish uh, pervasive. Uh, therefore, this circuit does not have any sort of precedence on, on what es establishes pervasive and severe uh, because uh, the Shellhammer case uh, did not outline that. However, the Shellhammer case did outline uh, what the basis to impute liability is. And in that case, uh, they did not find a basis to impute liability on a landlord that was specifically discriminatory against a tenant. Therefore, in this case, where a landlord did not act uh, directly in the uh, discrimination, there's no basis to impute liability. So it fails to meet that element uh, required for a hostile housing environment claim. But that Shellhammer case does rely on Title VII by analogy, doesn't it? Uh, as far as I'm aware, Your Honor, uh, the Title VII analogy is is unimportant because they rejected the hostile housing environment. But that's an answer, but it's not to my question. <laughs> it was relied on by the district court, wasn't it? 
I know, Your Honor, because the hostile housing environment claim itself was not relied on. Whether what they based that on it is unimportant because it, they did not advance the theory. Well, oh, Counselor, I might just have you brief that for me after these arguments. That sounds great, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Counselor, if, if, if we follow the Second Circuit decision in, uh, in Francis uh, v. Kings Park, which uh, Counsel for Appellant uh, pointed out is, is uh, the case she li or he liked the best, uh, do you lose? Uh, no, Your Honor. And uh, uh, well, actually, actually, Your Honor, I, th I think I should clarify. Uh, there is a circuit split on the matter of hostile housing environment claims. So it's up to this court to decide uh, what cases are uh, persuasive on this matter. Uh, first and foremost, the trial court did not err for pointing toward the Ohio Supreme Court because there is an interest in maintaining not only geographic uniformity of the law, uh, but also that federal claims uh, are not dramatically different than state claims in the context of fair housing which is why in the Ohio uh, Civil Rights Commission v. Met Akron Metro Housing Authority case, uh, the Ohio Supreme Court soundly rejected uh, hostile housing environment claims due to the distinctive agency principles at play. Uh, furthermore, neighboring circuits, such as the Seventh Circuit, uh, should be uh, held in more regard uh, because they have consistently held uh, that uh, hostile housing environment claims and that Title VII uh, should not be analogized. For example, the Wetzel v. Glenn case that opposing counsel raises uh, as in support of their uh, Title VII analogy uh, did not actually analogize Title VII. They an analogized Title IX in that case uh, and soundly rejected. Uh, and if I may briefly conclude, Your Honor. Briefly, please. They soundly rejected uh, uh, Title uh, VII uh, due to those distinctive agency principles. For those reasons, we ask that the court uh, not hold uh, the landlord liable in this instance uh, because there is no basis in either the fact or the law. Uh, the Hossein's chance for relief lies not with Quality Properties, Inc., but with their harassers. Uh, there has been no federal case that has held landlords liable uh, when they are non-discriminatory actors uh, in this case. And therefore, we ask that this court affirm the motion to dismiss. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back to Councillor Hill for rebuttal. Excuse me, Your Honor, I have to handle some technical difficulties, but is the court ready to proceed? Please, yes. Thank you. Um, the focus of the rebuttal focuses on opposing counsel's argument that agency is a key factor here and that that is the basis for liability but we strongly reject that analysis. Wetzel v. Glenn held that liability arises when the, when, they play, when the defendant has the quote unquote arsenal and tools to change the behavior. In this case, that is exactly what quality properties had. They had the tenant handbook, they had the community board to police and protect, which they signed up for in the lease and refusing to follow and enforce their own terms they signed up for, they have failed under 3604B because they discriminated in enforcing, in enforcing those terms after post acquisition. And finally, in speaking on this, again, this is a motion to dismiss. All the Hussein's need is one shot to prove that the hallways of hate existed on quality properties, that it was at least plausible that a hostile housing environment existed on quality properties in order to reverse the trial court's decision here. And we're asking that court to do the, the court to do that today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you all. We'll repair to our deliberation room and return as soon as we're finished with that important task. Thank you all. I will take that as my cue to go ahead and start. Um, first and foremost, congratulations to all four of you. That was an incredible round and you should all be really proud of yourselves. Uh, I think I speak for Nicole as well when I say that we really wish this would have been in person uh, because it's a very rewarding feeling to see that kind of response from people. But know that everyone watching, your friends and family, are incredibly proud of what you've done, and you should really feel that way. For those of you that are joining us here that are unfamiliar with the process, we started with 13 applicants who competed in initial rounds, at which point we sorted them into four brackets, and these four are. Uh, those that, that successfully made it through. 
Uh, there were a lot of initial rounds and I believe eight practice rounds once we had the four finalists selected. So I think they were very well prepared and I hope that was reflective today. Um, I, in addition to the four finalists, would like to thank and congratulate everyone who participated uh, generally, like I said, there were 13 of you and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a time commitment for sure, whether you uh, make it this far or not. And you all uh, took that time commitment on and gave your best effort and you should all feel incredibly proud of yourselves as well. I'd also like to thank the faculty judges uh, for taking time out of their schedules and providing amazing feedback that I know all of our competitors benefited from. And I'd also like to thank the fellow moot court competitors who assisted in judging. Uh, I, I know that that was incredibly helpful for both Nicole and myself. That was really necessary for our for our busy schedules to have to have extra help. Um, and lastly, of course, Nicole uh, did so much work here with putting everything on and 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 communicating with everyone. Uh, and that was really invaluable. Professor Chafee, thank you so much, especially for for being a faculty advisor and, and really giving us all of the necessary tools to make this uh, go as smoothly as possible. Um, I, I can say for myself that when I was in this moment last year, I let out what felt like was a breath I'd been holding for about six weeks. And for probably a good 12 hours, uh, nothing else in the world mattered to me other than feeling relieved that I was done. So I hope you all feel the same way. Uh, you all did really well and should be incredibly proud of yourselves. Um, I, I don't I don't know if I have anything else to add on top of that. So just congratulations again. Yeah, I don't really have too much to add to that. Thank you, Sam. Um, I just wanted to echo and highlight the um, work that you guys put into preparing for this competition today. A virtual competition, the first ever foreign off virtual content about in 50 years. So that is an incredible accomplishment. There is a unique challenge with looking into a computer screen and not having the ability to be at a podium and be in person with an audience. But you guys handled these challenges with grace and humility and flexibility with all that came with preparing for and ultimately competing in this virtual competition. So I myself thank you uh, for the four of you and I echo Sam as well for all of the original competitors who engaged in this process. This is something that's been around Toledo for 50 years and it has been uh, a pleasure to help coordinate it along with Sam and Professor Chafee. And I just wanted to echo again that these unique challenges are something that I mean, we've never faced before and you guys well in your preparation and it showed in your competition today. Um, and I just want to echo and thank you guys as well as the uh, faculty and students that have helped make this run smoothly, uh, as well as Dean Carnes, who is our um, kind of behind the scenes person helping us shift from round to round and competitor to competitor to today. So um, congratulations again. I echo Sam. Take that sigh of relief um today and really take that forward of this major accomplishment that you've all excelled at today of your first oral argument in front of three federal judges is not not small you guys and it's a it's a huge accomplishment so take that with you as you go into the future with the um, confidence and presentation skills that you've learned and just congratulations again so I will hand it over to Professor JV. So I feel like I have a captive audience because I want to know who won, uh, meaning that that was an absolutely fabulous round. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Um, you know, wonderful round, wonderful questioning. Thanks to the finalists. Um, yeah, it, being a part of the preparation was great, um, meaning that uh, terrific people to work with, um, all of whom are very thoughtful and um, made for a lot of really enjoyable practice rounds. Um, Thanks to all the competitors. Uh, you know, this year, the quality of competition was extraordinarily high, which meant that we had to make a lot of very difficult decisions as to um, you know, who would win rounds. Um, and you know, we 
got a bunch of great people in this round um, who all did terrific in their arguments. Um, yeah, it was wonderful to uh, watch. Yeah, it makes uh, all of the work behind this worth it. Uh, this really is a community effort uh, in the sense that there are a whole bunch of people to thank. Um, yeah, the staff, uh, Jody Birch, Deanna Case, uh, Mary Lynn uh, Valdez, uh, Dakina, uh, Maureen Dwyer all contributed to this. Um, you know, the administration, uh, Dean Barrows, Dean Rapp, Dean Tomlinson, um, all of them were supportive and played major roles in the success. Uh, I have to mention uh, Dean Carnes, who, uh, with the departure of our tech person, uh, basically uh, pushed all of this into cyberspace and did an absolutely phenomenal job of keeping track of literally every issue that that required um, and addressing each one of them. Um, you know, I, I was expecting something horrible will happen. I, I ought to knock on wood that you know, something's not going to happen as the judge did, judges give commentary. Um, but you know, everything has run so smoothly and so wonderfully. Um, she did that the, with the help um, of uh, Brent Sile uh, shot uh, from UTIT, but uh, both of them deserve a lot of credit and especially Dean Carnes. Uh, I'd like to thank the faculty, um, especially our lawyering skills faculty, uh, professors uh, Kate O'Connor, Connell, Lisa Burns, and Marilyn Preston for putting together this problem. Um, terrific, timely, uh, thoughtfully done, and um, pretty evenly balanced, which is tough to do with new court uh, problems. Uh, which have made um, preparing for this competition wonderful. Um, and beyond that, this is what um, everybody wrote their appellate uh, briefs on for learning skills. So people started out with a very sophisticated understanding as uh, we started with the practice rounds. Uh, I'd like to thank the faculty as whole for uh, judging rounds, especially Chris Beach, um, who teaches our moot court class, who um, I judge a lot of moot court rounds because I'm moot court advisor, and I, I've done that for a number of years since even before um, I was moot court advisor, uh, and you know, I'm actually more surprised when Chris is not there than when she's there, uh, meaning that she judges that many rounds for us, um, and she always asks insightful questions and is incredibly prepared, um, and I was happy she was uh, able to judge so many practice rounds this uh, year. Uh, I'd like to thank the moot court uh, board. I'm excited for the moot court season, which will be coming up in the spring um, under the leadership of Aubrey Merkel. I'm really excited about that. And I know that uh, they judged a lot of practice rounds um, as well to get this competition underway. Uh, and uh, I have to thank Judge Carr for finding our wonderful panelists. Um, I've worked with him now for a number of years on this competition. Um, he is always excited about it. He always finds us wonderful jurists. And you know, frankly, when I came here and joined the faculty, um, one of the best parts of it really was the opportunity to get to know uh, Judge Carr, to talk with him about his experiences. Um, he's a wonderful jurist, um, incredibly bright and incredibly thoughtful. Uh, so thanks so much for his involvement. Uh, finally, and last and definitely not least, uh, thanks to Nicole and Sam. Um, you know, as a faculty advisor for anything, there's always a risk because um, you get all the blame if something goes wrong. Um, and none of the credit, and I don't deserve any credit here. Um, I just I did my part or whatever I was asked to do. Um, all of it really should go to uh, Nicole and Sam or um, the lion's share um, in addition to the other people I, I thanked. Um, you know, they've been on top of everything throughout this competition, and um, you know, it really is something that is at the heart of what we do at University of Toledo, um, you know, this particular competition. Um, is part of uh, what I look forward every year as a faculty member and something that we've done for roughly half a century. Um, and they really carry it on the tradition. Um, so thanks so much for their hard work. Um, absolute pleasures to work for. Uh, if I ran a law firm, I'd hire them um, and I'd pay them lots of money. So if there's anybody out there um, in our uh, large um, audience who wants to do that, I recommend it. I recommend it highly. I recommend the same thing for all of our competitors um, who are absolutely wonderful people. Uh, and thanks finally to the audience. Um, you know, we have had um, over the course of this roughly about 150 attendees, although that you can't see that. Um, it'd be nice if we're in person, but it is absolutely fantastic that we were able to move this into cyberspace and that so many of you were able to participate and come and see all of this. Uh, with that, um, you know, I think I've complete, completed my Oscar speech. Um, so uh, thank everybody in the world. Um, so what we'll do is um, the people who are uh, currently on screen will all turn their cameras off and the judges will return um, hopefully shortly and tell us uh, who won, uh, which you know, I'm as excited as you are uh, to hear about. Thank you.
Perfect, perfect. Welcome back, advocates. Um, well done. We had a robust deliberation. I, I think any one of us will um, say that what we had to do was enjoyable for us, um, what we did in private, but um, not easy in that part of what we're called upon to do is identify best oralist and then also best team. But the nice thing was we, in doing that, were able to speak about the many highlights of the arguments. So it was a pleasure to be a part of this for and off competition and to observe each of you. To start with the results of our choices, um, best oralist, Mr. Hill. Best team, Appley. Not easily decided on any score, but certainly well earned, Mr. Hill, well earned, Appley, and that is a nice segue to you, Ms. Barshall, because uh, I don't want you to think that you are unimpressive in any way. Going first is not ever as easy as you made it look. And you know, one of the things I loved about you, you reminded me of myself when I used to perform um, court arguments. You ask if I like facts, and there they were. And then you came to the end of your time and you ask if you could finish, and I said briefly. <laughs> You went quickly, which told me you were ready. You had more. Anyway, I enjoyed listening to you very much. I admired your command of the case law, the Ninth Circuit Modesto case, the Seventh Circuit Block case, all right there at your fingertips. One of the things we, we shared, I'm not really sure where each of you is in your law school studies, but I certainly hope you'll consider applying to be law clerks for one of the federal judges um, in an area where you like to live. So congratulations, Ms. Barshall. Mr. Hill, you know, it's not easy uh, to present an unpopular opinion as you were forced to do as the appellant, but then to remain involved, to listen attentively. What's the judge's uh, interest? What points do I need to close out on rebuttal? And I think you did that phenomenally. It's very important. And I love the theme uh, you created, not only the picture of the Hall of Harm, if that's what it was, I mean, the visual image that that created, but that you used it during your argument and you came back to it in rebuttal. And um, I think, you know, rebuttal gives you an opportunity to study and advance some points you might like to make, but I promised you a question. I don't know if you remember that. I didn't need to ask it because it was in your rebuttal, which told me that you were in tune with the challenges that you and Ms. Barshall were facing. Mr. Kulik, I, you know, I started out, I didn't even let you clearly identify <laughs> your position, but I suspected what it would be. I thought you'd be the counter to Ms. Barshall, right? But you never begged off. You never said, judge, hold up. That's not my point. And you could have. And that's what a real advocate does. A real advocate does his best to meet your judge, where that judge is, and move your position forward. I, what year are you, sir? I'm the second year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, congratulations. Extremely well done. And then, Mr. Easley. Yeah, I had some fun with you. I sort of did the same thing. You know, we, we were on the hot streak. So you, you know, you may have gotten the hottest bench of all. And, and I had some fun with you because I, I really think you ought to seriously consider when to make a concession, but steer the judge away from it. Because I, I just wanted you to agree that Title VII had been analogized and Shell hammer, but judges, you shouldn't make that mistake again. <laughs> you know what the <laughs> district judge here did was correct. But in any case, um, I, I really thought your command of the law, your um, poise, regardless of the questions that we were throwing at you, and there there were several, and they were there were good questions. I was interested. Like, what's he going to say to my colleague's question? It was a pleasure. Congratulations to all of you. Judge Napper Barker, yeah. whichever. Let, 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 let me jump in. And it was a it was a treat to watch the four of you, um, the the poise and command, and 
and we can say, well, it's easier to sit in front. It's not easier to sit in front of a computer screen because you can't pick up on the furrow of our brow or sort of the nonverbal. It's really tough. And I think you you all, you know, that, that's an anvil around your necks as you're swimming across the pond. And I think you all did spectacularly. I was impressed. I won't say surprised, but certainly impressed by the poise that you all showed. Um, and I, I'm just going to take you a little bit behind the wizard's curtain here, uh, Mr. Hill. Uh, for me, what, what put you over the top was that rebuttal. And maybe that's not fair because nobody else got to do one. But to me, that's that's an opportunity, you know, and, and sometimes the quarterback gets to be the MVP because nobody else has the ball with, with a minute left in the game to go down the field. So I think perhaps you had an opportunity that no one else did, but but damn it, you made the me you made the best out of it because you hit Judge Pearson's question and and and, and you did a I think a really good job of picking up on on the why you should win. And, and what was wrong with the other and that's that's exactly what you needed to do and it's exactly what you did so perhaps you won uh by by virtue of of the opportunity that you were given but you didn't fumble the ball you you, you threw a touchdown so nice nice work but but the other three of you uh holy smokes what a, what a nice job and and i think you had a a, a pretty hot bench and uh it, you know because anybody can stand up there and talk for 10 minutes um it's how you respond to the questions. I think you need. I think you need to be careful not to concede something uh, that, that you shouldn't concede. But you also need to concede when something is inevitable. And even if you really hate it, like Judge Pearson said, concede it and then explain why that shouldn't apply here or why that court was wrong or you know. But but don't just don't just deny it because I think that that screws up your credibility a tiny bit. But but in other instances, I, th I think a couple of you were were because I'll tell you in the real world, the appellate judges sometimes will will try to 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 uh, to get you to concede something, um, and, and if you do, then then you end up cutting the cutting the branch off and you fall to the ground and you were on it. Okay. They take you out on the branch and then, and then they, they hand you the saw. And if you cut the tree off, you're, you're kind of, you fall to the ground and unceremoniously. Um, I, I, I'll just pass along to you an opportunity to pay attention to the questions that, that the other side gets. And if there's an opportunity to answer a question that they got better than they did i, I and and I, I think that's an opportunity for you all just to kind of put in your your bag of, of tricks um i didn't i didn't really catch anybody doing that but if uh it's just something that uh, I, I think is a, is a is a fun opportunity uh to, to you know and the closest i think we got to that was was aaron with the with the rebuttal so judge barker I can't say much more uh, than Judge Pearson and Judge Neff have already said, except to say that I was very impressed with each and every one of you. There is no doubt. Certainly, uh, Judge Pearson and Judge Neff have covered some of the bases that we discussed uh, during our deliberations and made the appropriate suggestions to each one of you. But your command of the case law and the issues and the facts underlying um, the lawsuit were, were certainly very, very good. So again, I think you were very impressive, and um, I really have nothing else to add to what's already been said except to say congratulations to you all because you all did a very, very good job. Thank you. Absolutely. Professor Shappy, anything more from the court? Uh, no, there's not. Uh, thank you all for uh, doing a wonderful job uh, judging. Uh, thanks for a wonderful event. Um, and with that, I think our court stands adjourned. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for attending. Take care. Stay well, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Your Honors. Thanks, judges. Thanks, everyone.